Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to recitation four for eleven seven eighty five. Uh, today we will be discussing about a new tool TensorBoard and see how we can use TensorBoard to visualize our networks. Uh, we'll also be discussing some of the techniques to see how we can understand data and how we can visualize data to uh, pre-process is better. Um, so before we go what exactly that is, I assume that everyone has installed TensorBoard. We made a post on Piazza yesterday regarding the same, regarding how to install it. If you're using Conda, just make sure that you are uh, 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 you are installing TensorFlow in it, and it automatically installs TensorBoard with it. If you're not using Conda, you can use pip to install TensorBoard, but that you need to make sure that you also have TensorFlow installed in it. So you can install both TensorFlow and TensorBoard, and you should be good. Um, to, we'll be going through the, recit the, the recitation notebook as well today, so make sure that you have the notebook, and you can go to this link and get the notebook from there. And have it downloaded so you can see, uh, because we'll be performing, we'll be running the cells, we'll be going through uh, each, uh, each cell and then we'll see how it's actually logging the values in TensorBoard and it requires you to run the Jupyter Notebook locally as well. So make sure that you download it and not just see it. Okay, so why exactly is visualization important? Um, I'm assuming everyone has started with at least homework one part two and we, and we know that to evaluate a particular deep neural network, loss is not just a metric that we should be looking at because there are tons of other things as well involved in a network. Um, how your gradients are being calculated, how much you are multiplying it with your, uh, how much does it get multiplied with the activation functions and how much you are back propagating and so on and so forth. And this is something that you really need to visualize and see and before making any changes to the network, for example, how much should I change my learning rate? How many, how many layers should I have in my uh, uh, neural network? How many neurons should I have in each of the layers? It is important that you know what exactly is, what the consequence of doing that would be. How, learn, how changing learning rate would affect the gradients or how exactly your gradients are being calculated right now. And if you clip it by a particular value, what exactly is going to be the change in the network? So it's important that you know and you answer, you are able to answer these questions before you, uh, you're able to answer these questions at least when you're running your models. So it basically tells you and basically answer the questions for the, what exactly am I learning through the network? And loss is, a, of course, just one metric of it, but also tells you other things. So one thing that it uh, helps you with is you can uh, plot matrices with it. Now, you know that every weight matrix that we have in a network, I mean, every weight that we have in a network is a matrix, and the gradients that we calculate also is a matrix. So we can plot the matrices and see what exactly are the values in the matrices. So what exactly are the gradients that we are calculating for each layer that we have? Um, and this would help us to answer the question that will adding ad additional layers in my network be any significant, will give me any significant results? Because now we know, and because we can see how my gradients are being calculated for each layer, I would know that whether my gradients being calculated are similar or not. Because if they're similar, it basically means that you are going to add uh, layers in your network, and with that you are going to add redundancy in your network, which is going to increase the training time of your network, but wouldn't necessarily give you a lot of, uh, wouldn't necessarily give you an increase in the accuracy if it's a classification task. So uh, it lets you answer the fact, it lets you answer the question that whether adding a, an extra layer is going to help you or not. Also, it can also, it also helps you to uh, do trial and error uh, uh, things. For example, you can add extra layer and see if the gradients are different for it or not, if the weight matrices are different for it or not, and uh, possibly also see if my, if my loss function, uh, loss, val loss values are being decreased or not. Um, as we are going to see in the later homeworks as well, that we'll be using recurrent networks for our, uh, our homeworks. Also, the data set that we have for homework one part two has a temporal associativity. So that same data set can also be fed uh, for a different task, of course, can also be fed to a recurrent network to make to make uh, better classifications. We'll be discussing about the task later on, but uh, we can be for uh, for any data set or for any task which has temporal associativity with it. Uh, we can use recurrent networks for it, and using recurrent networks brings in the problem of exploding gradients and vanishing gradients. So we we, ha we generally have to clip our gradients to a particular value to make sure it does not just uh, blows up. So if you're able to see the gradients, we'll know what exactly should be the value for us to clip it with. And we just won't be using any random scalar to clip our gradients with. Because that can definitely lead to a slower convergence and therefore a slower, uh, it'll take a lot of time for you to achieve better accuracies. Of course, the question of when to stop training, as we discussed in the uh, last recitation as well, early stopping is one thing that we should be using to uh, evaluate how exactly my model is performing on the train and the validation set. 
So uh, uh, it is possible that uh, we, we did see a lot of people running their models for 100 or maybe even more than 100 epochs for homework one part two, which is definitely not the case because you won't be running your network for that many epochs and you should be getting a much better accuracy before that. So it would have been, it would be really, uh, uh, beneficial for you all to see how your train loss is decreasing and as, at, at the same time how your validation loss is uh, increasing or decreasing as well. And you would want to stop your train network training as, as uh, when you see that your validation uh, loss uh, increases after a particular time, uh, after a particular epoch in training. Uh, also something that we discussed last time uh, while we were discussing about different tuning methods was how we can initialize weights. And today we're gonna see how exactly weight initialization uh, 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 play, why exactly it plays a very important role. Uh, as we discussed last presentation, we, if we are initializing our weights to zero, we know that we are multiplying anything with zero and then adding it with zeros and it's all just zeros. And when we are back propagating our gradients also do not get a good value for us. And the values that we get from back propagation do not make sense. And we'll just see how it, why, why is that the case. Um, also, you will be, you can see how, and how different your activation functions are for the data set and for the task that you're evaluating. Uh, again, something that we'll go through in the notebook. Uh, different tricks like batch normalization, dropout, what they're doing to the network, is, are, are, they, are they making sense? Uh, uh, are they affecting my network too much? These questions we'll be able to answer. In general, it helps you fine tune the performance of the model that you have already created. Um, also, it tells you whether you need to add something in your model or remove something from your model as well. So what TensorBoard does, um, for evaluating, what we have been doing right now is just uh, plotting a scalar value of loss and seeing if the loss is decreasing or not. But you can think of TensorBoard as a visual logger. We don't have to log these values anymore. We don't have to write print statements or have a logger set up to log these in a particular text file and go through the text file and see. We can just log all the values in TensorBoard and TensorBoard is automatically going to plot all these values for us, which will make it easy for us to visualize the um, you know, visualize different things. Um, um, it helps you, of course, understand debug and optimize your, uh, the neural network that you have. And one of the most important APIs that we have for TensorBoard is tf.summary API. Now, tf.summary API is a public API that uh, uh, that TensorFlow that was originally designed for TensorFlow, but later ad adapted for other uh, frameworks as well, like PyTorch. And what it lets you do is it lets you log all the operands uh, of your graph. Now, when whenever we say that, we know that when when we are making a neural network, when we are making a deep neural network, we are basically making a graph, and in in that in, in, we are basically making a data flow graph. And in that data flow graph, we have the operands, and we need to plot those operands to see how the values are. So when I'm saying that we need to log the operands, we basically log all the weight matrices, all the losses, and all the other uh, values that we have. Now, using TensorBoard, you can log scalar values. You can log uh, matrices as well, two-dimensional matrices as well. But how exactly are we going to visualize a particular matrix? If you're just plotting the matrix value itself, doesn't make any sense to us because then again, we'll have the same problem of logging versus visualizing. So what TensorBoard does for you is it uh, visualizes a particular matrix using histograms. Uh, and that histo and, and we'll see how exactly it does that. Along with scalars, along with two-dimensional, so scalars are one-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional weight matrices are, uh, we can plot it using histograms. You can also plot images through it. Um, so think of, uh, so it for, it, when I say that we can plot images, we, I basically mean that again, it's going to be a matrix. It's going to be two dimensional. It can also be three dimensional where we, the third dimension could be the number of channels that you have in that image. And the tensor would automatically plots that image for you. So you can think of confusion matrix as an image because that's a two dimensional matrix. And then you have values between, and it, you can have values from zero to infinite, depends on the number of samples that you have. But you don't have to worry about how exactly I'm going to normalize those values in my conf confusion matrix. You can directly just create a confusion matrix and send it to TensorBoard to plot, and it's going to plot all the values for you. And we'll, we'll see how it does that. Along with t confusion matrix being a type of image, we can also, we'll be using uh, convolutional neural nets as well. Uh, uh, in the next weekend's one, we'll, we'll, we'll get to know more about what convolutional neural networks are, what filters are, and what, uh, what other things involved in the network are. And when we do that, we'll, we, we know that we'll be having different parameters. We'll, have, we'll be having filters which basically extract the information out of a particular data that we have. It could be image, could be speech, anything. And then that filter, again, is a two-dimensional thing. And we can use images to plot the filters and see what features are being extracted by my model. 
these things are important and you'll realize soon in the part two of the homeworks that we have that you need to understand what your models are uh, learning. So starting with, uh, 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 it also lets you log text values and other stuff. Uh, but primarily we'll be talking about scalars, histograms, and images. Um, so starting with scalars, uh, so we, we know that a scalar is going to be a one-dimensional uh, uh, one dimensional array or one-dimensional object. Now, we definitely would have to see how exactly the value of that one-dimensional object is changing with, with time. Because we'll be, running our mod we'll be running our models for different epochs, and we need to see how that value is being decreasing or it's changing with, with number of epochs. So the way we plot a scalar value is uh, we, the, we plot it in a two-dimensional setting. And the second dimension is going to be time for us. And that time would, def would you can say that time is also the number of epochs that you train your model for. Um, uh, so you have your so in a particular uh, in a normal in a generic uh, uh, um, a neural network training setup you will have your uh, your loss would be something that's scalar your prediction accuracy would be something that's scalar your learning rate would be something that's scalar so you can plot all these values using uh, using tf .summary .scalars. Now, how exactly are you going to plot your weight matrices? And that's what I meant when I said we are going to plot histograms. So, for a one-dimensional uh, scalar, we were plotting it in a two-dimensional setting, right? Because we wanted to have time dimension as uh, in it to see how it's changing with time. So for a two-dimensional uh, uh, two object, for a two-dimensional matrix, we'll plot it in a three-dimensional three setting where the third dimension is, of course, going to be the time. So this here is an example of us plotting a weight matrix which has been initialized to a mean of zero. It's a normal distribution. The weight matrix has been initialized with a normal distribution. The mean of that normal distribution was zero, and the standard deviation was one. So we can see, um, uh, and, and, and the normal distribution was one. Now, the z-axis that we have made here, the z-axis is the time dimension. So if we see farther away in the time dimension when it's initialized to zero, this value, we can see that the mean here is, going, is, is zero, is centered around zero, and the standard deviation is around one. Uh, and this, the, and what the way that we are plotting it is basically we are with with increasing number of uh, epochs, with increasing time, we are shifting the mean. It's basically a running mean, something that we have been doing for a lot of time. The standard deviation for that particular distribution for that particular weight matrix is constant. It's, it remains the same, but the mean has been changing throughout, and it's, it's increasing. So we can see as the time is increasing, this particular distribution is changing from zero, and at the end of around three and, uh, at around 400 epochs, the distribution is centered at mean of five, and it has the same standard deviation. So, um, so here, what these three axes, uh, what, what exactly are the values in these three uh, dimensions? Um, Z, of course, is the time. Um, X axis is going to tell you what are the values uh, for in your weight matrix, and the Y dimension, how tall your histogram is, is basically telling you how many values do you have for that particular value. So suppose that you have uh, 100 values for uh, value equals to five at time equals to 400. So that's where the 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 height, the Y dimension, is very large at. At x, at x equals to five. And the value for y decreases as we move along because the mean, of course, is five and you'll have a lot of values at five for this particular distribution. And we'll see how these histograms are. Um, the third thing that we can use uh, TensorBoard to plot uh, are images, of course. And as we discussed that we, uh, n now images, of course, are going to be uh, two-dimensional in the sense that you will have a height and a width for it, but of course it'll have the third dimension of channels where you can see different colors in it. Um, and of course you can see how it's changing with time. So you'll, al you'll always have that uh, time dimension where you can scroll through that and see how the particular uh, image has been changing uh, over, over the period of your training. So it's a single matrix in an image um, and you can plot it. Um, you can plot, of course, CNN filters, kernels with it. You can plot confusion matrix. Uh, you can plot a confusion matrix with it. And uh, the tf.summary.image automatically captures, uh, the, automatically does the normalization for you. So you don't have to worry about keeping the values between 0 and 255 to uh, get a particular image, to plot it as an image. You could, it would be any value and it automatically rescales it to 0 to 255. Um, now, how exactly can we run TensorBoard on AWS? Because a lot of you are going to use AWS while you will be training your models. So um, TensorBoard comes pre-installed in the deep learning AMI that you use to uh, that you use in the instances that you use on AWS. 
Um, you just have to activate the, the, net, the environment that you're using. If you're using PyTorch, you use PyTorch underscore P36 for Python version 3.6. If you're using TensorFlow, you activate the same environment, and then that TensorFlow is pre-installed, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you're training on AWS, you'll not be able to see what exactly is happening in the network because you don't have a browser there. So whenever you start TensorFlow to log values in the browser, uh, you will not be able to see it. So it's important that you forward the port on which TensorBoard is running on that particular instance. So TensorFlow, then TensorBoard by default runs on port 6006. So what you can do when you are SSHing in, in your particular instance, you can just forward that port using the hyphen L command. And uh, once you do that, once you SSH in and once you start TensorBoard on your AWS machine, it will automatically forward the port, the default port for TensorBoard. And you can then visualize and you can see the entire TensorBoard uh, module in your browser. Um, that's all what I have for slides. Let's go. Let's shift to the Jupyter Notebook and let's see how it exactly we are going to do that. And I advise you also if you if you guys have installed if you guys have the notebook locally, let's let's do it together. Okay. Okay, so the task that we are going to uh, work on is the same task that we took up in recitation two. The task exactly is going to be that you'll have your training data as a set of two points. You'll have x1 and x2. They are going to be polar coordinates uh, on, on an xy dimension. And what you're, going, what you're going to do is you are going to predict whether that particular point that you have, the polar coordinates that you have, they lie within a circle of radius one or not. Um, if you want to go more into the details of what exactly was the task to, I suggest that you go to recitation two and then see it. But th that's, that's uh, uh, on hindsight, that was what we wanted to do. Um, uh, so the, train the dimensions that we are going to have for our training uh, data for the x that we have is just going to be one cross two for a s single sample. If we do it in a batch, it's going to be batch size cross two. And the labels for it is just going to be one dimensional, it's going to be scalar. More specifically, it's going to be binary because it's a binary task. We are trying to predict whether it's inside the circle or not. Um, so it's the same task that we'll be doing. Um, now, how exactly TensorBoard works is that you have you, you make use of the tf.summary API for it, and there is a method for it, a file writer method. And the moment that you type in tf.summary.file writer and provide in a particular directory to it, a, a particular part to it, it automatically sets up TensorBoard to look up logging in the particular part that you provided. So for example, what we're doing here is that we are initializing a writer object, and that writer object is the file writer object that we have from the TensorBoard. And we are asking that Tensor, uh, we are asking the TensorBoard to log or to look for values that we are going to log in the logs directory that we have. That, log direct, that logs directory is in the same directory as, as this particular notebook, so that's why it's dot slash, and then we have logs. Um, what it does is basically it creates a writer object that can then uh, write events. Uh, in that directory, and then TensorBoard automatically picks up all the events that you have stored while you are running the program from that directory and plot it for you. Um, we'll be covering how we are going to do that both in TensorFlow and PyTorch, but we'll, we'll be starting it with ten TensorFlow because uh, TensorFlow, TensorBoard was primarily designed for it, and it's easier to un at least understand what TensorBoard does there. So, um, for people who are doing it in TensorFlow, I don't think I should be saying that, but for people who are doing it in Tensor flow their ten, TensorFlow, the assignments in TensorFlow, it's better that you don't follow the recitation notebook as is because there are better ways to use TensorBoard as well. Um, and we can, we can talk more about how we can use the hooks for, for plotting the values and so on and so forth. So let's import all the necessary uh, libraries that we have. And similar to recitation 2, we have a particular function that is going to generate the polar coordinates for you. Basically, it's going to generate the x and the y for you. Um, so this function is, I'm just going to hold on for a second because I think the values are, uh, is, it, is it me who's doing something? No. Okay. Is it good? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, so 
the function, the sample points function is the same from recitation to where we are just sampling random points uh, for x and y. We have the labels as well, the labels are binary. And then in this particular third cell, what we are doing is we are generating the data set. So we can see that the shape of our x is uh, 10,000 cross two, the shape of our y is just 10,000, it's just binary. Um, then we have total number of, the total number of samples that we have for this task is 10,000. Now, for logging a particular value in a partic for, a, for a particular setting, we just have to change the directory where we are logging the paths for it. So for example, if we want to write all the values for this particular setting of a network and then for, and while we are training it, the path for, for which we are doing it is just logs and train. So in, inside logs, I'm again creating a subdirectory named as train and in that I'm going to log all the events for it. Um, uh, so, so this example is particularly in TensorFlow. I'll just briefly go through it and, 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 and explain it what exactly this is. And what we're doing here is that we're just building the graph for, our, for, for the setting. We are going to use, the number of layers that we are going to use is going to be two, and the number of units that we have in each layer is going to be the same, it's going to be 12. Uh, it's, go it's a very small neural network because the task itself is not that, um, uh, that intensive. Um, we have the activation layers initialized, we have the weight initializations and the bias initializations as well. Uh, our x's and y's here are the exact same x's and y's that we have initialized before. It's just a global step to keep track of how many epochs are we, uh, are, are we running for in the network. And what, what we do here uh, is for each layer in the number of layers that we have, we, I just apply a dense layer. A dense layer is a fully connected layer and it automatically creates the weight matrices for you, um, initializes it using this kernel initializer that we have, initializes the bias for that, net, for that layer using the bias, the bias initializer that we have, and uh, using the activation function as well, it automatically applies the activation function for you as well. Finally, when we have passed it to two layers, what we want is we want to create logits, and the logits are going to have a dimension of batch size cross number of classes. Uh, the number of classes we have in our task is just two, so that's why the number of units here in our logits is just two because it's a binary classification. Um, then we are going, we are calculating loss using a softmax cross entropy, and then we are just reducing it on the batch dimension to get the mean of the total loss that we calculated for that particular batch. Um, so. This is, pretty, this is pretty straightforward. We have the Alum optimizer as well, and then we are using optimizer to minimize the loss we have. Now, what we are doing here is, this is something that is really uh, uh, important for TensorBoard. So we are computing the gradients here, and for each gradient that I have computed, I am using tf.summary.histogram, and in that particular method, I first provide the name for that particular matrix, which, could, which is just a string, which could be anything, and then finally the value of it. So it's, it's pretty simple. We just provide the name that you want to plot it for, and then you just give it the matrix that you plot. Um, similarly, for histo sim uh, uh, what we're doing here for two-dimensional, it's pretty similar for, three uh, for scalars as well. Here, what we are doing is we are using tf.summary.scalar and plotting the loss, the scalar loss for it, and, and also we're plotting the accuracy for it. What we're doing here in this particular line is we're collecting all the train networks, all the parameters that I have. Uh, they're all two-dimensional weight matrices and then using histogram, I'm just plotting the name of it and the matrix, it, that's it. And I, I use tm.summary.merge all to merge all the event files that I have generated yet to merge it in a single doc and just plot it uh, on TensorBoard. TensorBoard. I'm just going to run this cell uh, and that's it. So, uh, so that's it. We can, you, can, you can use scalar to add uh, uh, scalar values histogram to plot 2D matrices. And now what this particular function is going to do is it's going to run your neural network for uh, a default setting of 100. And uh, then it is what, it, what we are doing here is we are just running the value, um, getting something out. We are getting the summary op that we had out of the graph. We are adding it uh, in, in the main file writer object that we created. So here what we are doing is train writer underscore tf is the file writer that we initialized before. We're just adding the summary uh, and we're adding the time step at which we're adding summary. So it's going to be the number of epochs and we just use the file writer dot flush method to flush it to the tensor board. So let's see. Um, now, now what we're doing right now is I'm initializing the weights for my network from uh, pretty close to zero. So it's going to be from minus 0 0.01 to a max value of 0 0.01. My biases have not been initialized, so they're going to be zero. They're important because we'll see, because they'll, we can see that they'll be initialized to zero initially. And then let's start. So we started training and it has now created all the uh, required event files in the directory. So I'll just briefly go to this. 
So um, this is going to be the directory uh, in which I'm running currently my Jupyter Notebook and it's the same directory in which I'm logging as well. So we can see that we have a logs folder here and in that logs folder, my file writer object was creating a subdirectory of train. So we have that and in that I have an events file generated. Now TensorBoot is just going to pick all the values that we have uh, outputted in this events file and plot it and that's it. So we are, I'm just going to zoom it in a little. We are going to go in the same directory that we have been going. So it's the same directory that we have. We can see that we have the TensorBoot IPython notebook and the logs directory. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call in TensorBoot with a log, uh, with a particular argument which is going to be log dir, which tells where the log directory is. Uh, it's, it is nothing but it's uh, logs for us and that's it. And let's start. So then the board automatically starts itself on, uh, it'll start on the default port of 6006. So we need to go check our local host uh, 6006. And we can see that we have our, yeah, sorry. Uh, so what you are going to do, let me do it again so that you can, yeah, follow it. So you'll be typing TensorBoard and while you type TensorBoard, you have to follow it with a particular argument. That argument is going to be log dir. It's going to be the log directory. Is it visible? Uh, pretty well enough, yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah. So we have TensorBoard, we have the log directory, we're passing in an argument there and that equals to the logs that we initialize the file writer object with. Right, let's start it. So we have started it and we can see it automatically starts up at uh, 6006, the default port. So we can go on localhost and see this particular port. Okay, so important stuff first. The three values that you're seeing on top, the scalars, the distributions, the histograms, they are basically what we have discussed so far. Scalars, histograms are histograms. Distribution is also a way of plotting histograms. We'll see what exactly is the difference between distributions and histograms. Um, for images, if you are plotting images, another tab here will come and it will be named as images and you can click on it to see how the values are. So let's first see. So we did decently. Uh, our accuracy did increase, but it only increased after 120 epochs, which is primarily due to the fact that uh, we initialize our weight very improperly, initialize it close to zero, which is not good, um, which we have been uh, focusing on for uh, for some lectures and some recitations now. So, but I mean, and we can see why. Even though our loss is decreasing till 120 epochs, and we can see that it started with. It started with a value of 0.89 and till 120 epochs, it did reach a value of 0.7. But the accuracy during this did not even move. It was 0.52 and then it, re it remained 0.5. So if you were just logging in losses, you would see that your loss is decreasing and you would expect your network to really learn in the first 10, 10, 20, maybe even 30. And now you've run it for 100 epochs, you would definitely want something out of the network. But the accuracy wouldn't really improve because your gradients are, will not make any sense. And let's see, let's see how, what your gradients are looking like. So that's your loss, it's your accuracy. Let's first look at the histograms and then we'll be looking at the distributions. So what, here, what we're doing here is for each layer, we are plotting in the biases and bias zero is going to be, is the bias that we have, the bias vector that we have for that particular layer. Kernel is the weight matrix that we have. Um, as we can see, this, this dimension is a time dimension as we discussed. Now it was initialized improperly and it was initialized close to zero. We can see that the, the maximum values are 0.5 and minus 0.5. And even after running for 200 epochs, the values haven't really changed that much. It has remained pretty much the same. Uh, there is some hope at least for the weight matrix that we have. We have, you can see that these values are increasing a little, but there are certain values that are diverging as well from zeros and that's good because we wanted that. We wanted it to be diverged enough so that we are able to learn something. So we can see that it's really reaching there but we are wasting a lot of time just by initializing it to zero. Same goes for the second kernel and we can see it's, all of them are gen, just zeros. Some of them did diverge and they are possibly the uh, values that were giving you the decrement in the loss that you were seeing, but you're not really learning, and learning anything because more than 80% of your network is just zeros. The neurons are not firing, you're you not, you not getting any values for it. Same goes for bias as well. Um, so, this for, this is for, so these were for the two layers that I had. This is for the same for the last layer uh, that I had, the logits in which I'm creating the logits. These are the gradients that I'm plotting. And 
you can see pretty much that the gradients are itself zero because you initialize them to zero for all the biases and the weight matrices. They're they're, they're at zeros. They're I mean they're not at exactly centered at zero. We can see it's centered at 6.99, but they're not changing that much. And there are some values that change that did change, but not really giving us a good score. And similarly for all the different things we have, we can see all the different weight matrices. Great. Um, now what we are going to do is let's let's change this initialization. What we are going to do, I'm going to use Glorot initialization, which is pretty similar to Xavier initialization that we discussed last time. Um, we are going to use that to initialize our weight matrices. It initializes it using the same formula that we had to underscore that number of inputs, outputs, and the square root of it. And the bias initializer, uh, init initializer is going to be from values of minus 0.2 to 0.2. Um, so I did not go through. So these are the histograms that we have. What exactly is distributions? So distributions is just a way for you to know what is the maximum and the minimum value in your particular weight matrix right now. So you could see that initially at epoch zero, I initialized my weight. Uh, I, init I did initialize my weight. So I am I'm seeing this wide uh, divergence here. But for the kernel weights, you can see I initialized it pretty close to zero. It was 0 0.01 to minus 0.01 to 0 0.01. So initially, they're all just zeros, the maximum and the minimum values. And for the first 40 epochs, they're not even changing. And in, in, at around 60 epochs, they change to something like 0.1 and minus 0.1. And then they keep on diverging. So wouldn't it, it would have been really, really beneficial for us to initialize these values from in the range of, let's suppose, 0.3 to minus 0.3 and start the training from there. And because in that case, we wouldn't have really uh, spent 120 epochs or even 200 epochs learning nothing. Similarly, we can see that this kernel weight has been initialized pretty close to zero, and only when we run it for a lot number of epochs, we can see the maximum and the minimum value diverging enough. Um, uh, and so for the gradients, even the gradients that we have, so for 60 epochs, the gradient for my first matrix was just zero, not learning anything. Um, what, so what I'm doing here is I'm initializing it with Glorot biases. Let's see how it does. So now the only difference that I have here, everything is same. The except the file writer object that I had. The file writer object, now I have changed it to log values in train underscore in it. And when I, 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 I ran that and when I'm going to refresh this, I'm going to see the train underscore in it graph as well. Now I can see and I can, uh, so let's start with scalars again, like we did last time. So now we can see and we can plot how exactly these two different things have worked for the 200 epochs. Great, initially the loss uh, the accuracy for our model for both these initialization was 0.5. Makes sense because, because we were just randomly guessing. It's a binary classification, randomly guessing, not learning anything. Accuracy is 0.5. But with increasing number of epochs, this with our, with our initialized, this value has definitely increased a lot. It has reached to an accuracy of 0.94 in 200 epochs as opposed to 0.58 for the previous initialization. And so is, has our loss as well. So the loss that we have is also lower. Uh, for, be for better initialized uh, graph. Let's see the histograms. Now, we can see a lot of divergence here, which totally makes sense. A lot of divergence means good, it means that we have our biases and weights uh, uh, spread out throughout the network. Um, similarly, we can see how we have initialized it closer to zero and it's not really changing, but now with Glorot initialization, it's spread out throughout the range of under uh, square root of six and, uh, and using that formula, it's spread out throughout that uniformly. And it helps the network to diverge enough, get proper gradients as well. Same goes for my bias, same goes for this final kernel as well. Initialize it properly. A, a good divergence generally uh, uh, make, means a good uh, calculation. Let's see the next page. Let's see how our gradients are performing as well. So even I can see that I have my gradients as well spread out. And you can see the values at which they're spread out. They're spread out to a very large value. They're not, they're not between 0 and 1. They're not between 0 and 10. They're spread it over very large value. And we'll just see in the next example when we have different activation functions as well, how these values can be really, really large, which causes the problem of exploding gradients and you need to clip those values. And using these graphs, you can, you can, get, you can get a better idea of what that clipping value should be, what the clipping scalar should be that we discussed last time in the last dissertation. Similarly, for these gradients, we are seeing a, we're seeing a decently enough uh, 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 distribution, not so much in this because it's the second layer and the, it's the second layer for our weights. Uh, and so on and so forth. Right. Now, different activation functions. So this was, this was different initialization techniques, and you can see how they are performing. Now, different activation functions. So some of the most common ones are uh, sigmoid, tanh, relu, uh, 
that we have asked as well for you, for you to implement it in your local department. But uh, let's see the down. Let's see what the pros and cons are for the activation functions and see how they and we'll see how they perform. So for sigmoid, uh, we have the formula of one upon one plus e power minus x, and that basically means that the values that you will be having for any value of x will be between zero and one. Right, the, the function for the sigmoid starts from uh, pretty close to zero and goes to a value of one for positive values. It's pretty close to zero for a value of uh, minus infinity. Um, so the values are pretty squashed up in that range of zero to one, in that y range of zero to one. Um, and that's one of the biggest problem of the sigmoid layer. It easily saturates or easily dies off. When I say it easily saturates, I mean that when I'm multiplying something x, w plus b, and, I apply, and if that value is large enough, then the and if I apply sigmoid to it, then it, the values are going to be pretty close to one, so they have saturated. So for a particular value of x from if my x could be w x plus b could be something like five hundred, w x plus b could be something like fifty thousand. But because we are using sigmoid, the values are going to saturate. Similarly for negative values as well. So the problem of sigmoid is is that it saturates and. Uh, that is a problem which is pretty common for tan h as well. The values will not be from zero to one, it'll be from minus one to one. They'll be centered around zero, but still it, you have that range of minus one to one where, the, where your final output is going to be after you apply the activation functions. Um, and that's why the convergence also is a little slow in these networks because you're not allowing your gradients to vary that much. You're keeping them in a particular fixed range. For ReLU, that's not the case, right? Because it's not us squashing activation function. It's much like a threshold activation function. If it's less than zero, I don't care. It's all zero. If it's greater than zero, just keep the value. Let's see how it goes. So that's why it converges quickly, because you're not squashing. You're not making your gradients to go in that particular range. But the problem with ReLU is that for a, let's suppose that you're passing something to in your network, and you've made a huge update to the weights. Now, if you're changing your weights too much, if there's a big gradient that you have updated your weights with, it is possible that your weights are now negative. Now, for any positive or negative input that you have in uh, that you are going to feed, the product of W x plus b is it is possible that the, that product W x plus b would always be zero. And now, because you are applying ReLU, that particular neuron is never going to fire at all because the values will always be zero. Why? Because you had a gradient update that changed the weight and the bias uh, vector to a very large negative value. So now you have that problem of dying. Uh, of, of a dying neuron, and that's very, very common in ReLU. So one common way to avoid that is to keep your learning rate a little lower for ReLU, because if you have a high learning rate, you're directly multiplying your gradients while you're back propagating, and, could, and that could potentially lead to you uh, updating your weight matrix wrong. And, and that's why for, for, for to counter this specific problem of ReLUs, we have leaky ReLUs as well. And what leaky ReLUs does is, for all the values less than zero, it does not just keep it to zero. It gives a very small uh, negative value for it. it it's like something like 0 0.001 or 0 0.01. And, and that makes sure that your neurons never die off. Um, something for you guys to try out is to see how the Xavier and the he initialization works on all the three different activation functions. And you'll get to know why we're doing that. Let's, let's plot. Uh, so uh, I'm using the. Uh, I'm using the different activation function for, for all these different networks. It's going to be sigma, tanh, and relu. I'm just going to run this, and I'm going to see how exactly are my values changing uh, for all these different things. So let's start with scalars first. Um, I don't want to, oh, sorry, I don't want to see this. Don't want to see train in as well. Just want to see sigma, tanh, and relu. Great. Uh, as expected, the problem with sigmoid is that it is squashing your gradients, not giving you a great accuracy. Leaky ReLU is really performing well, even better than tan H, as expected. And so are the loss values as well. So we can see that for sigmoid, it's not really performing that well. Leaky it is. Loss as well for leaky ReLU is much lower than the loss that we are getting for sigmoid and tan H. Um, you can go through the, the histograms as well. Uh, yeah, sorry. You don't actually. Okay. <laughs> you don't ever use in, in in sigmoid used to be a great activation function. People did use it, but uh, after ReLU was 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 after ReLU and different versions of ReLU, sigmoid really just died off. Okay. 
you don't really use sigmoid. Uh, you can never use sigmoid. Maybe you can use something like tanage, but always go with relu or leaky relus. <laughs> Uh, for a lot of tasks, they're pretty pretty generic, um, and you can see the uh, you can see how your network is being distributed for 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 the values as well. Um, I just wanted to see because I've I've been talking about the gradients for sigmoid and that stuff, and just want to see the gradients, and you can see the gradients for the sigmoids are just squashed up. They they're not learning anything, which goes with what we have been discussing for a long time now. So you can see how the distributions are, how the histograms are changing, and what the maximum values are, and see how they're performing. Um, finally, we want to plot images as well. Um, and uh, what we can do is you can use the tf.summary.image to plot a particular image, and the input to that has to be just a weight matrix. That's it. You don't have to worry about anything. Pretty similar to what we have been doing for histograms and scalars. And now what we're plotting here is uh, the confusion matrix. So I'm going to create this new graph, and I'm just going to uh, start training it for like 50 epochs and see how my images are being plotted. So if I refresh this sensor board, I can see now that I have an images tab and I can see this is my confusion matrix now. I can scroll over it, scroll over this from first step. So what exactly is my first step? What exactly are these values? So, uh, uh, so in a zero to 255 scale, zero is black and 255 is white. So we want our confusion matrix to be all white in the diagonals, right? Because we want higher values to be on the diagonal and lower values on the non-diagonals. So initially, that's not really the case. Um, you still have values. Uh, sorry, you still have values that are non uh, that are not present here, but uh, that that are present here um, uh, and here. So and with increasing number of steps, step here is the epoch that you have. With increasing number, you can see how your confusion matrix is changing. And finally, it does get better, not really, but if you run it for more epochs, you can see how it gets better. And it is something that you can just plot and see how your confusion matrix is also changing. And you can see which, for which particular class you're performing better, which, which particular class you're not performing better. If it's MNIST data, you can see why exactly seven and nine so closer and why my network is not properly predicting seven and nine or so and so forth. And you can see, the, see that with confusion matrix. Um, some, uh, uh, also, when we are plotting these values, we can also plot, like what, what we're doing here is we are plotting it for train. You can also plot it for validation, and you can plot it in the same graph. And then you can see that your training and validation loss should decrease initially. And the moment your validation loss starts to increase, uh, you can stop that. And that's, what, uh, that's how you can easily implement early stopping. Um, finally, for a lot of people, how exactly we're going to use in TensorBoard. So the problem is plotting in PyTorch is a little different because you'll not be using the tf.summary method, the public API itself, because it's primarily made for uh, static computational frameworks like TensorFlow, Keras, and, and, and Tiano. Uh, but for PyTorch, you can use the tf.summary class itself and log the values. So what we are giving you here is a logger class, which you can directly just use and plot your values uh, uh, in the network with. And we can see that in, in here, we have this self.writer as the same file writer uh, object that we have been initializing with a particular log directory. And instead of using tf.summary with a small s and then adding histograms to it, what we are doing is we are using the main class of summary, and then we are using, uh, we are using it to plot a particular value where uh, I have a particular tag as my scalar value, uh, a tag as a string, and simple value is just a value. This particular function in this logger class is the log scalar um, is, is the log scalar method. The tag is the string, value is the, uh, value is the exact value of the scalar, and step is the number of epochs that I have it for. And uh, similarly, uh, I won't go into the details of how exactly we're plotting histogram. What, what we're doing is basically we're creating the, out, the tensors to NumPy objects and then using that NumPy objects to plot it in, uh, uh, in TensorBoard, because that's what we have to do uh, when you are using TensorBoard for it. But this is, this is, this is a function that lets you plot a histogram. Um, uh, we have shared a particular GitHub gist here as well. You can go through this gist and this gist. Uh, we have taken this particular snippet from this gist itself. You, there, uh, and in this particular logger class, you'll also get the method to plot images. You can just use that and plot the images as well. We have not taken, we have not taken that snippet here. And just use it. And finally, uh, this is something which is exact same, uh, which is exact similar to what we did in recitation two. Initialized our model with linear, ReLU linear. Uh, we have created two logger objects here, the training logger, the validation logger, and finally, this is the same training routine, ex exactly same. Instead of printing values that we were doing in recitation two, 
uh, if I mod 100 equals to zero, what we are doing is we are using the uh, training logger to log scalars and log histograms. That's it. You just have, and you can get all your named parameters, all the gradients that you have using the network.named parameters. You'll get the values, just plot them directly using the, the logger class that we have given you. You have initialized it, and then you are going to run this. Um, and, uh, sorry. Let's refresh it, um, and we can see this is the train pair torch thing here. The network is different. That's why the accuracy is a little different. Uh, let's just see this. So this is something that we are plotting for PyTorch. It's pretty similar. The, the concept is just similar. What you are plotting is similar. In the histograms as well, you can see uh, the, the plots for your Py, the, what you have trained in PyTorch, and you can see your biases, your gradients that you are calculating, and so on and so forth. It looks pretty different because the network is different. Um, and, and that's it. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's it for TensorBoard. And now uh, Nihar is going to explain the different techniques that we can use to visualize data. There are two cables on the oh, HDMI one only comes to the webcast. Yeah, I think this is it. Yep. Hey, there we go. Okay, uh, hi. So firstly, is there anything wrong with this side? It's, it's, it's such a non-uniform distribution. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, get it. <laughs> so anyways, uh, you, you've been training uh, data, you've been training on MNIST, you've been training on the speech data set. So, when you think about it, an MNIST image has, what, 784 dimensions? So do you actually need so many dimensions to classify something? H humans, as humans, when we, see, when we look at something, for example, this shed, we, we kind of live in a three-dimensional space. So we, we don't exactly need to know 784 values to understand that this is a chair. So why do you think the network would need it? Do you think the network would need 784 dimensions to say that a digit, a, 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 an image, is, uh, corresponds to a digit, which is one or two or three. You don't, you don't need it, right? So, so basically, we are just wasting a lot of space. We don't need so many uh, independent or dependent variables to tell that something corresponds to something. So basically, what, we are, what, what the lecture uh, now, right now is going to say, going to talk about is dimensionality reduction, that you, you don't exactly need so many pixels. So how do you reduce the number of pixels to get to a much smaller uh, number of variables that represent the data? So, so what, uh, let's uh, look at some nice uh, example. Let's look at this pig. So this is an adversarial uh, example. So this pig, as it is, if you run it through any latest uh, model, which is a VGG or any, any uh, model, it'll tell you that it's a pig. But just changing a few pixels in it, just add some noise. This is not a dumb way of adding it, but it's an adversarial way wherein you actually train the network to cheat the model. Right? So just add some noise, smart noise, the network is wrong, completely wrong. So why do you think it is happening? As, as a human, you cannot say the difference between this and this image. right? So why do you think that's happening? Come on, take, take a guess, guys. <laughs> yeah. Higher okay, that's, yeah, higher dimensionality, definitely, but why exactly? Um, the network learned that pig and airliner were like close values, so when you yeah. added the noise, it 
See, <laughs> so that that is uh, that is what happened here. Like you added the values in such a way that you cheated the network. So the the reason that this is happening is basically because there is there are so many values inside this image that are not actually helping the network in classifying it as a pig. There are so many extra values there. So you basically just change pixels in such a way that those pixels uh, uh, tell the network that it is an airline. But as humans, we, we can't really cheat it. So this is also a very big problem in uh, current scenarios wherein you can just print these pictures, take it in front of an autonomous driving car, whatever it is, and, and the car uh, understands what the image is. So it, it is a huge problem. So companies, big companies basically spend a lot of time so that they are, uh, the, their models are not prone to such problems. So how, how, how can you uh, reduce the dimensionality of an image? We, like it is established that you don't need all of those pixels to get there. So firstly, let's talk about uh, mathematical methods, how people used to do this before. There are two ways, uh, linear models and nonlinear models. Yeah. And yeah, so li linear models are basically a linear combination of all, all of those pixels or some small subset of those pixels which actually represent the entire image. And then nonlinear models uh, like the TSNI are they are based on some probability distributions. We'll look into that. And also, there is a huge branch of uh, machine learning called the unsupervised learning, wherein you just give the image and the label, and the network learns to reduce what 500 cross 500 pixel image into a single class label. So th that is dimensionality reduction, right? You're taking 500 cross 500 pixels and then getting it down into one single label, one hot representation. You get it? So. Uh, in fact, you have also been doing some sorts of dimensionality reduction, wherein uh, you, you send in 784 pixels of an MNIST image into a neural network and get out a one hot representation. It is also so, uh, sort of a dimensionality reduction. It is just uh, using a neural network. And lastly, we'll be concluding this by uh, the ZCA, which you will be implementing in the next class. It is not a dimensionality reduction method, but it is a way in which you can uh, highlight those features in an image that actually correspond to that actually help the network focus on the important regions that give you the output. So you don't have to deal with the, the noise in it. So let, let's start with TSNI. TSNI is a t-distributed uh, stochastic neighbor embedding. So basically what happens is, uh, so this is a very slow method. Uh, can you see it? Can you guys see it? Yeah. So basically, we have these samples in some space. So what TC does is it picks one sample, compares this sample with every other uh, sample in your data set. And then it uh, takes, it projects it in, uh, in a form of a normal distribution, basically. So we have this distribution. So suppose you're starting with this sample. The sample is here. And then you calculate the distance with the sample, probably it, because the sample is very close to this. It is plotted here, and then this guy is plotted somewhere here. And since this one is very far away, that comes towards the edge of the distribution. Right. Yeah. So basically, this is your uh, initial distribution, and this is how you're uh, trying to cluster it. So. You can see this as a two-dimensional representation that you're reducing it into a single-dimensional representation. So this is a really nice method. You, you can get some really cool results with this. Keep doing this for all of these samples. It runs iteratively. So you, you have to compare every single sample with every other sample inside your data set. So as you can see, it might be really computationally expensive. So this is not really preferred. You'll also see how long it takes to probably uh, cluster 10,000 samples uh, in, a, in a while. So you have to keep doing this for all of them. Another problem here is the distances are not going to be the same for each cluster. So you ideally would want to have these three. So you'll have to normalize each of these normal distributions and then uh, put it on another dimension. Yeah. So finally, once you're done with this, once you have your uh, similarity scores between each of these samples, you plot it as a, a matrix. 
So this matrix basically represents the distance between the samples. Obviously, the diagonal is going to be the distance with respect to itself, so that is a zero. So every other sample, you, you can see that this is how the clusters are forming. The blues become one cluster, the reds become one cluster, and the yellows become some other cluster. So yeah, so basically, in the sample, you have uh, reduced three-dimensional data into two-dimensional data. And this applies for all. Uh, it doesn't really matter how many dimensions you have, as long as you keep comparing it. But since you can see, it is very slow. So uh, we'll be going through the Python notebook. Uh, did you guys download it from GitHub? So we'll get there in a while. So we'll be using the MNIST data set to see how we can uh, cluster these data. So the next, uh, next one is a linear uh, model, where you use some linear combination of the variables that you have to uh, reduce the dimensions. For example, uh, let's, let's do this. So you see, you have uh, the same three-dimensional space. You have some samples plotted here. And then what you do is, uh, so this is, this is a bit cool. So you'll probably be uh, implementing some normalization in your next homework, so this might also be helpful for that. So this is your distribution initially. So basically, everything about PCA is you're, you're trying to fit a line in between these samples. You, you, you try to fit a line in such a way that the uh, variance is very high. I mean, you, you select those dimensions that add uh, the highest variance to the data. And then you, you can also look at it in this way, that you're trying to minimize the distance between the samples and the line that is being drawn in between them. So firstly, uh, you zero mean it, that is you shift the mean like we discussed in the previous lecture. You just take the average of all of these points and you draw a line, you, this is the mean. And now what you're trying to do is you have to fit a line between this. You fit a line in such a way that the distances are the least and you have the highest variance. The, you, can, you can understand this as the samples are very nicely distributed. It's, it's the highest distribution that you, have, you, can, you can have on the, that line. So that is what is being uh, shown here once you have that distribution. So the, the higher dimensional data that you have can be put on a line and can be shown as you're reducing the dimensions. Any questions until now? Yeah, so you, you can basically uh, only do this for data sets that have uh, really high correlation. That is, if you have a Really, if, you, if, your data set, if your data has high correlations, you can turn off some uh, pixels that are not adding real value, right? If, if, you're, if you're using five pixels to show the exact same value, you don't need five pixels. You can remove the four and you can just use one. So that is how this works. So let's move over to the Ju Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, firstly, uh, have you guys installed Pandas and do you have NumPy with you right now? Okay, so anyways, if you, if you don't have the MNIST uh, data set, you can just download it from the link that I've given. So the first step is uh, just importing NumPy, import Pandas, and then you have to uh, just read the MNIST values, load it in this step here, and then you separate out the labels and the features. So basically, you. You, you'll be running PCA and the TSNI on the features, not the labels. You, you don't really have to worry about labels now. Because you are trying to cluster the data without actually knowing the labels. So you can use it as a comparison matrix uh, after all of this is done, but right now you don't have to look into it. And then in this step, it is basically uh, helping you to uh, better plot the data. A data frame is basically one of the uh, container objects that helps you put images into it and represent it in a tabular form. So this is uh, what we have. You, you have selected 30 random samples from the MNIST dataset you have. This is how your uh, MNIST dataset looks if you haven't visualized it in the first assignment itself. 
So these are your digits. It's, it's a 32 cross 32, or 28. It's 32 cross 32 sized images. Yes. 28? Yeah, 28. Okay, so you, you don't have to implement PCA yourselves. Uh, there are libraries that do it. So sklearn is one of the libraries that you can just import and run your PCA on that. So uh, what this line does here is you, you are basically selecting the values, uh, the features from the MNIST images. Uh, you've picked around, what, 1,000 images? Yes, yeah. you, just, you just pick your uh, features, and then you push it to the PCA.fit uh, transform. Before that, you uh, tell the network, you tell the PCA class how many components that you're trying to reduce the data into. Like, you have 784 dimensions. You're trying to project them into three-dimensional space. So this is what uh, PCA result holds. So here, you can just run it. It is very quick. PCA is super fast. Yeah. So once you run it, you have your uh, values stored in the DF object here. So you, you can try printing what DF has. You can see that it is a scalar. Yeah. You see that it is a scalar. So you're you basically reduce your 784 dimensions into three dimensions, and this is your first dimension. You can print uh, three dimensions and see it, all of them are just scalars. So this brings us to a, another question, right? If, if you are projecting so many dimensions into a uh, much smaller dimension space, how much variation is it going to capture? It is obvious that you're going to lose some data, but how much data are you going to lose? So in this case, uh, in this case, you basically lost yeah, so the sum of all of this is what? Less than 25, it's around approximately 25%. So you've lost 75% of the variation in your data. So when you try to compress all of that into such a small dimension space, it's obvious that you're going to lose data. So how can you change this? You can probably uh, improve, increase the size of uh, the dimension space that you're trying to project it into. But we'll see how it will work. We'll get there in a minute. But before that, let's try to plot and see how this works. So this is your clustering. This is how your MNIST uh, dataset looks when you try to push it uh, in a three-dimensional space. Does it make sense? Yeah. So a uh, mean center is uh, basically, yeah, you have to use it for PCA. So you don't have to do it right now because the library is hold, uh, doing all of that for you. Because the PC is uh, exactly. Online, so. Yeah. So you have to do that. But that is being done already. You don't have to worry about it right now. It's so you can see that the data is not uh, really nice. It's it's not clustered well. It's it's all random. You can't really make anything out of it because it's just capturing 25% of the variation of the data that you have. So let's see what happens if you try to. Uh, project the MNIST data into 50 dimensions. So obviously the results should improve, but how much? So once you run this, you can see that uh, the variance that has been captured in 50 dimensions is almost 83% of the data, 83% of the variance that is in the original data. So this, this kind of tells us a story, isn't it? So do we actually need 784 pixels? We don't. So why can't we just use a PCA, reduce the dimensions, so that you have much faster computation times, and uh, you don't have to uh, worry about the training being too slow? It's just one of the things that people do. But there are better methods now. You can use autoencoders and stuff like that. But this is what people uh, initially worked on. So why didn't we start with uh, TSNI? So basically, TSNI is very slow. Tsli is a probabilistic method wherein we, we, show, we, we saw how uh, each sample is put on a normal distribution curve, and then we compare the distances. So it's a really good method. It's way too slow. So running Tsni on 784 dimensions is stupidity. Just don't run it. You'll be crashing your computers. So what you can do is reduce the dimensional, uh, dimensionality, use PCA first. Uh, Go from 7, 784 to 50, and then you can probably use TSNI to see the results, at least to visualize it, in probably one or two minutes. So let's try to run this. Okay. As you can see, it, it, take, it takes a while. So 
you keep running it, and then what, what, what's happening internally is each sample is being compared with every other sample in the data set. So it, it takes a lot of time, but the results are good. Good in the sense it doesn't really help uh, apart for anything apart from just visualizing that you can cluster things like this. Yeah. And yeah, so, so once you're done with it, this is how your plot is going to look like. And you can see the difference in PCA and T-Sneeze. This is really good. Uh, you, you can uh, humanly cluster different digits. Uh, any questions? It's a really good class. You, you can cluster it. But the problem is you can't really use this data for anything else but visualization. Uh, any questions with t and PCA before we move on? So basically, it's not a linear combination, right? I mean, you're losing all of your uh, data that you have initially. So you're comparing date, uh, each sample with each other, and you're losing that uh, variation that you would have. And this only works with clustering. You can see that you can see how close each sample is with each other. But apart from it, what, what else can you use it for? And like realistically, you are already removing all of the uh, dimensions by projecting it down with the PCA. If you want to use it in realistic situations where you want to use it on a complete image, for example, most of the images that we have are 4K. 4K is what? 8 million pixels. How would you do it? It will probably take a week to compare 10 samples, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. When do you know whether TC or PCA works better? PCA always works better. So this, this is for human representation. So this works very well to see how clustering works. So TSNE also works well, but you cannot use it in any realistic situation. PCA is much faster because it's just a line fitting algorithm. You have your samples. You just fit a, a line, as, as you can see. So here what you have, you have all of these samples. You start from some random line like this, and you keep uh, turning or changing the slope of this line until the distances between each of these samples is minimum. So it, it's very easy to fit in a line than comparing each sample with each other. So it's not, real, uh, you, you, it's not practical, you just can't implement it in real world scenarios. Yes. OK, so just, just a quick question. If, if, you draw, uh, if you try to do a PCA for this class, how would you cluster people? How many clusters would you have? So, so you are a non-uniform distribution inside this class. You're sitting like this. <laughs> so if you, if you try to uh, do a PCA here, how would you guys cl be clustered? How would this end up? How many clusters would you be expecting? I mean, it depends how low the variance is. Sorry? So where is the mean of this class? You'd probably find a mean somewhere there. Yeah, so you find the mean somewhere there. This would be a cluster. That would be a cluster. You would be a cluster. And this whole set would be a cluster. So, but, but these methods are antiquated. You, you usually never use this in, uh, these days. You'll probably be, uh, you will be learning about encoders uh, soon. So you'll understand why those methods are way faster, way better than what we have, right? And one, of, one other thing, uh, what, what, what could you guys uh, say about PCA? Right? Do you think linear combination works? I mean, can you, can you just... Uh, say that, OK, I can linearly uh, combi uh, combine these variables inside the image. So is that enough? All right. So basically, neural networks help us in this way. You have various levels in which you pick representations at various uh, levels of hierarchy. So that is way, more, uh, way better, because you, you cannot judge uh, how the linear, how the uh, dependencies between pixels are just by looking at one la uh, layer of uh, input. You, you, you can keep doing it hierarchically, and you'll, it, it's bound to get better results. So coming back. And finally, we'll be talking about ZCA. So we, uh, till now, we spoke about methods where we can reduce the dimensionality of the data. But ZCA is something different. 
Uh, we, the reason we are speaking about it is it is one of your, uh, it is the first part of your assignment, the second assignment. So ZCA basically helps you, uh, helps the network in, it is a pre-processing step that uh, helps the network focus on areas that are actually important. For example, if you have uh, an image, so if you have an image like this, and you have uh, what? Some interesting object, probably an apple here. So do you actually need to uh, look at the entire image, focus on the entire, uh, all of those pixels to get features out of it? No, right, so ZCA basically helps us focus on the blob in between by just killing all of the other pixels and increasing the contrast or increasing the, the making the features more prominent of the things that actually make uh, make a difference. So that's about GCA. You'll be you'll be uh, looking at uh, various other things like how to use SVDs, how what uh, eigen vectors are. I can actually do a brief as well. So basically, these samples that you have. So if you, if you draw a vector like this, and uh, so basically you have to find the difference, right? So this can be represented, the vector that is pointing towards the sample can be, can be represented as a unit vector, which is also called as an eigenvector that you will be deriving in your first part of your next assignment. So that's about it for today. Do you have any questions? Questions, yeah. Yeah, you can use Xavier, which always works the best. Yeah, I think you spoke about Xavier initialization in the last recitation as well. About the bias matrix, well, what's the Log, log the values you can see how they're diverging and then initialize it to that diverge level. But there's no correct way of doing that. But it's always better to uniformly distribute it in a range of minus 0.1 to 0.1. Thank you.